And you guys will. Okay. Did you push record? I did. Well, you can edit that, means I asked it. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry. I'm going to cut it. Like I said, this it's just where you guys can realize that there's a camera on, and if there's something said that you don't know how to say again, you know, if you want to redo it, we can redo it. Okay. All right. Hey. Okay. So tell me a little bit about before you went into the military. Oh. I was a farm kid, born in Carroll, Iowa, on Labor Day. Uh, my mother's sister was appropriately named. Um, raised on a farm in western Iowa. Uh, we had two drought years and one hail year, so we ended up quitting farming. And uh, Dad moved to town. We moved to town. Dad was a body man. And, and I worked for farmers all through grade school, high school. Um, Worked in a grocery store, worked in a gas station. The typical things in small town western Iowa that you do, you know, to try to make a living and buy gas for your old car. You know, went to high school. Um, had a disagreement with a principal in high school. At um, In Iowa you had to have 32 credits to graduate. You got one credit for each class per semester, so you got four credits you took four classes, you got four credits for the first semester, four credits for the second semester. So you get eight credits times four years is 32 credits. I had my 32 credits but only seven semesters. So I wanted to get out, he wouldn't let me out, so I finally just quit and, and uh, enlisted in the Army. Went to Fort Riley, or went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for basic training. Went to Fort Riley, Kansas to on the job training. That was January 1966 I went in the Army. Went to Fort Riley, Kansas, eight, ten weeks after that. Um, so that was probably April. Uh, on job training, I was supposed to be a heavy equipment mechanic. And, and I was in Fort Riley. Uh, got on a boat, I think it was a Daniel Sultan troop ship. I remember they had a stacked five high in bunks uh, that were just sagging, like come out of a hammock. And we. Uh, Got off in Okinawa and went on shore for a little bit and took on fuel and, and food and landed in Vungtown October of 1966. Uh, went to Bearcat was the name of a big fire base that we built. I was a combat engineer. I was a mechanic in a combat engineer unit, but I was a lot better dozer operator, heavy equipment operator because I'd raised on a farm and a lot of these kids you know, come out of a city and they don't know what, you know, the, the Army assigns you a military occupational specialty. Well, they may have a cook running a dozer and he really should be a cook. And um, so we did a lot of swapping around doing that to get people where they were most qualified. So I ended up running a dozer and, and stuff, you know, knocking on jungles and building base camps and, and uh, that for really my entire career. I did spend 26 months there. Um, I just, By choice? Yeah. I, I, I was there. I extended six months. I, I think I had orders to go back to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri to, te to teach basic training. And I didn't want to do that. And I was very comfortable with the people I was working with in Vietnam. And I, I had a lot of confidence in them, in my fellow GI soldiers. And so I extended six months. So those orders were busted. And... Um, then I had another six months, and then when that six months was up, I can't even remember what my assignment was, but I knew that by then if you had less than 90 days left in the Army, uh, you could get out uh, and they would not reassign you because you had 30 days leave, so you'd have 60 days left where they'd assign you to another base camp. And It's really of no value to, to the Army or me to be someplace for 60 days and get out. So I extended where I had 89 days left when I got back to Oakland. So I just got out after the 89 days. Okay. So tell me a little more about your experience in Vietnam. Oh. What about some of the men you were stationed with? Did you become good friends? You know, I was... I was friends with probably 90% of them. Um, you know, it, it, just like in business, in any company, you have the doers and the followers and kind of 
for lack of a better term, the clerks that that's all they want to be. They just want to do their time and get out. And and, and we wanted to we, we were a very protective unit of each other. I mean, we were all, for lack of a better term, comrades. We trusted each other. You know, we lived with each other. Our lives literally depended on. We had each other's back all the time. Um, I mean, it was 24-7, literally. I mean, we, we spent, I spent three Thanksgivings in, thank, in Vietnam. I mean, so you, you really build a bond and a relationship with those guys, and you have a trust in them. And as they, as they rotate out, you get new guys, and they become acclimated. So we all became a very good, good, good unit, and uh, very, very comfortable with them. And I think one of the reasons I extended I, I told myself this 50 years ago that um, my brother wouldn't have to go. I thought, you know, that we could stay there and, and if I stayed there the war would be over and it technically wasn't a war. You know, Vietnam was a police action, but um, it was a war. When you get shot at it's a war to me. And uh, so I stayed there and hoping that my brother, you know, the draft would end and my brother would not go. And uh, ironically, he had tried to enlist, and he flunked his physical uh, because he had a hernia, and then he got drafted and he passed his physical. <laughs> and he ended up in Vietnam after I left. Um, I remember the day he left, I um, was standing in the driveway and gave him a hug and told him goodbye and, and to duck and, you know, just jokingly, and, and I had tears in my eyes. and and. My mother said, uh, why are you tearing up? I said, I've been there, I know what he's going to. And uh, I was very concerned about that. But uh, but we both got out of it, you know, unscathed, so on the outside, you know. Um, but you know, I, I went over in October 66, I came back in November 1968, November 30th of 1968. And but you never really leave Vietnam. You know, there's always the memories, there's always the scars, there's always, you know, the mental scars of being there and losing friends. You know, so, so you really, or Vietnam, Vietnam never leaves you maybe is the way to put it. The, the old adage, you leave Vietnam, but Vietnam never leaves you. Yeah, there's not a day that I don't think about it, or there's not a day that I don't see something that reminds me of it. The, picture on the wall that says Vietnam, the, the guy in the street that says Army or Vietnam veteran or, you know, a, a bulldozer doing construction on the highway and you think of pushing down jungles with a dozer. I mean, there, there's always a reminder every day of Vietnam, you know. Are there any specific experiences or incidents, I mean, after 26 months certainly, that come to mind you'd want to share, either positive or negative? Um, the positive was the people I served with and, and, the, and the friendships and the trust that you had in each other. I mean, you knew they had your back and I mean, you could count on those guys. I mean, we were literally brothers, I mean, in, in combat, if you will, or, or, or brothers in the same unit for the same cause. and. You know, we believed in that cause for a long time, and then at the end, I think we got discouraged because we knew it would never end. You know, we were never allowed to. We were always on the defense, and you can't course score points if you're on the defense. You know, we were never allowed to be on the offense, really. When in our job was to help the Arvins, you know, the Army Republic of Vietnam Army, and support them, and that's what we did. But I don't think we could ever take the lead, and just go like, you know, like Patton did through Germany or whatever, and, and just go out and be the aggressor and get it done with. And um, the uh, bad experience is you're always so wired. I mean, you, you are so wired. I mean, you're in a combat zone every, every night, well, six nights a week, probably, between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. If we were not back in our base camp, um, a mortar would come in, or two or three, and it was harassment. 
but you get out of your base camp and you run to the uh, communications bunker, the combo bunker, you know, until the mortars are all over, but they harass you, they keep you up two or three hours. So you're always tired. The, 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 the rains, you know, you rain for six months. You're slopping around in mud for six months and, you know, and the leeches are always on you. You know, ironically, I fish with leeches today for walleye bait. But every time I put one on, I think of Vietnam. But, but um, you know, that in the mud. And then the heat and the humidity in the summertime. I mean, you're always drenched. You know, you're, you're, you're cold from the rain. You're wet. You're soaked. Or you're, you're just sweating from the heat and the humidity. Uh, especially if you're not in your base camp. You're always out there. Uh, a little thing that's ironic, um, I got a CPAP here not long ago for sleep apnea, but in Vietnam you trained yourself not to snore because um, they could hear you at night. If you're out away from base camp, you know, out in the field, you you train yourself not to snore because it would make noise if there was a, you know, if, if the North Vietnamese were near they could hear that so all of us you know you would end up nudging people or you know um, the, probably the worst uh, couple of times were when I, I came in from from the field to base camp because I had a toothache and with three other guys and they the dentist I guess he closed at five o'clock like dentist or something. So I had to stay back in base camp, go out the next morning, go to the dentist the next morning and leave. The three guys that I came in with went back out that afternoon. They were all three killed on the way back out. So I have a lot of survivor guilt because if, if I could have got my tooth fixed and we waited 20 minutes, would it have been different? You know, that. The other thing that, that's horrible is My mortar comes in and, and it hit one of my very, very, very good friends. He was hit in the head. You know, you knew he wasn't going to live, and you're sitting there holding him. You know, and, and you literally are praying for God to take him, because he would have been a vegetable if he'd have lived. You know, and you know, that's a horrible thing to live with when you're praying for somebody really to die. But I was 18, 19 years old. I mean, you just don't know. Um, I think my faith kept me going a lot because. You know, I came back, you know, so God was good. The, the Tet Offensive of 1968 was by far the worst thing we had. It was, um, you know, it ran from January to April. And it was just constant, no sleep, always on edge, just, you know, we, we lost people. You know, it, it was their big run to get at us and um, you know we I survived it and I'm thankful for that you uh, mentioned that I think you mentioned you landed or you arrived at Vang Tau what part of the country were you in most of the time I was normally I was mostly bear camp was not far from Long Bend and Saigon we built the base camp and then they moved us to Dong Tau which was um uh, Mekong Delta and we built a base camp on rice paddies. I mean we moved I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of tons of dirt and we built the base camp down there and uh, it was an extremely strong Vietnamese Viet Cong stronghold because the rice is their staple for food and that's where the rice paddies were and they were they always tried to take control of that and we tried to stop it so the Vietnamese uh, civilians would have food and they were forever coming at us you know I mean we, we, we would try to build a base camp and then they would come in at night and and, and on, on we had Constantina wire up and we had Claymore mines set out and stuff but you know we're always building the next mile if you will or the next 200 yards to the left to fill dirt to level it so you could put tents on and uh, 
they would be out there at night and they're sneaky and they're quiet and it's dark and they would put a mine somewhere in the ground and then you'd be out there and, and so it got to where, I mean, you'd take a dozer and you'd be moving dirt and you'd hit a mine and then blow the track off the bulldozer. And so you're down for six, eight hours fixing that track and you know, you, you, you're working on it, trying to get it running, but you don't know because the jungles, you know, we cleared the jungle. Um, but it's not that far. You know, you can still with, be within sniper range, and every once in a while, if, you know, a sniper would take a shot, and, and um, it was just harassment more than anything. I mean, it wasn't all out for us, <clears throat> for my group, of combat engineers. It wasn't really all out battles or firefights for the most part. It was a sniper here, a mortar there, you know, a grenade here, just that kind of stuff that that. You were always so on edge and so wired. You know, I wonder back then, you know, sometimes what my heart rate was. You know, I mean, because you think, well, you know, it's supposed to be in the 60s. I, I'll guarantee you there's times my heart rate was 120. Because you're just so amped up, you know. You know, it's like you're on a treadmill, you know, and, and there's no end in it. You know, it's easy to get discouraged. What did you ever do on your time off, or for fun, or just to? I, in 26 months, I took one R&R &R to Malaysia for three days with some of the guys in my camp, in my group, and uh, I had a good time. And, and about, just started to wind down, and we got back on a plane and went back to Vietnam. The. Um, I did go to Bung Tao for a couple of days, just R and R, I think, because our company commander just said, "Boss, you need to go um, and uh, take a few days off." And because you know, you, I mean, you literally work can't see to can't see. I mean, almost you're you know you're there at, at one sun up, you know, and you're running and you run till dark, and then you come in and and you may. If you've got the energy, you may take a shower. Our showers were, we built some showers that are probably four foot wide and maybe eight foot high and they're probably four foot square. And we had 55 gallon barrels of water and we would, on top of those, and we would fill the water uh, barrels in the morning. Somebody would fill the water barrels in the morning and then it was hot over there, so the water would get warm during the day. And if you weren't too tired, you'd take a shower at night. And we had three, like Folgers coffee cans, one gallon coffee cans, or one whatever they are, three pound or whatever, looked like a gallon can. And we'd punched holes in them, so you could fill the coffee can with water, and you hold it over your head, and that got you wet. The second one, then you shampooed your hair, and then you. Um, hold another coffee can and you got the shampoo out of your hair and then you soaked up and then the third coffee can you rinsed your body out. We were allowed three gallons of water to shower a day. You know, so I mean as crude and rudimentary as that seems that was sometimes the highlight of the day. It's just getting the mud and the grime and the red dirt and the leeches and stuff off of you. And we, we just we could take a bayonet and scrape the leeches off or just pull them off but um, the, that was sometimes as crude as it sounds, was a highlight of the day. We, we didn't have downtime. You know, we didn't have Sundays off. We didn't have Saturdays off. We didn't have weekends. I mean, we were there 365, 24 7. Now, we were in base camp, but you know, the base camps are not secure. You, you're, you're not, the base camps are, for the most part, secure because we had perimeter, we had guards. And we had Claymore mines out and and, um, um, and and good security on the base camps, but you know in the jungle, the, you know the jungle might be a mile away, but a mortar they can lob a mortar in out of the jungle, and, and there's nothing the perimeter guards can do about that. But our tents were the olive drab army issue. We had four foot of sandbags, and then we had the tent that went up and then went up like this, and it's kind of like a reception tent at a wedding. And except it wasn't white, it was green, and, and we did pour concrete floor in some of them, 
Yeah, we confiscated some concrete from the Navy and, and uh, poured floors in some of them. Um, but, you know, and, and the only reason we had the sandbags, if the mortars hit short, the sandbags would take, take the bat, the blast. If we were unfortunate enough, and it never happened in our unit, where a mortar took a, where a tent took a direct hit, you know, where it came down on the inside of the tent. But um, <laughs> interestingly enough, and you get, it's amazing what you get used to. We set rat traps every night in our tents, and every morning we had rats in the tents. You know, it's just, you accept some of the crudest, vulgar stuff um, that it's, it, 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 it is what it, you, it is what it is, you know, I used to tell people at work, it is what it is, we just have to go on, you know, it, um, you can't change it, I mean, we had doors, we had screen doors on the, on the, on the tents, we had a little row of lights down the middle, we had a 5 kW generator we ran at night, so we'd have to get up during the night and put gas in it because it was just like a lawnmower engine. But it would power a half a dozen little open light bulbs hanging down from the ceiling. And, um, but it was, that was home. I mean, that was, that was, that was our living, that was our premier living quarters. It wasn't a tent. It wasn't laying on the ground. It was, I mean, it wasn't a two-man tent. It was, wasn't laying out on the ground at night. It was just... Um, that was our palace, our hotel, you know, our barracks. You know, it, it wasn't pretty, but you, you know, you, you adapt. It, it, you know, it, you know, and I, and I would think about that and feel sorry for myself. And I think of my dad, you know, in the Battle of the Bulge, or walking through Germany in, in two, you know, a foot of snow and, and that kind of stuff. And I thought, if my dad can do it, I can do it. You know, so. I think that's how I got through some of that stuff as Dad did it, and it was expected of me, you know. And I and I, I made a lot of rank fast in the army. I mean, I got off that boat as a private E one, and twenty months later, I was a staff sergeant E six. I got a lot of rank. I had, I was a staff sergeant E six under two years of service, and they had no pay scale for me because you had to be over two years of service. It was unusual to get that kind of rank. So they had to pay me as a staff sergeant over six, or over two years. Staff sergeant E6, over two years of service. Um, I was lucky with rank. You know, it just came. Yeah. Did you ever consider making it a career? Oh, when I, you have to go through the, um, the mandatory reenlistment speech. So the first sergeant was a good friend of mine, gave me the speech, and they offered me six thousand dollars to reenlist for six years. Now this is 1968. When I got out of the army in 1968, I bought a brand new Chevy for thirty-one hundred dollars. So I mean, this was a lot of money, and I really, really, really did consider it. And I thought, you know, and I could have, you know, then I would have gone stateside and I would have lived in a real barracks and, I, and it's my rank, I would have had a private room in the barracks. And I thought about it and I thought, you know, I haven't polished boots for two years. I haven't ironed clothes for two years. I haven't shaved every day for two years. I don't know if I'm regular army soldier anymore. You know, I think I was a combat soldier and not a regular army spit and shine kind of person. I didn't know if I could do that. And I thought, you know, I, I, I finally decided I was just going to get out. You know, be, and, and I think part of the reason I got out is because I never saw an end to this war. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I was hoping it would end, you know. And there were peace talks going on a little bit then, but I just didn't, didn't have a lot of confidence in, in it ending. And I call it a war because it was a war to me, but it wasn't technically a war. But I, I just didn't feel the loyalty is not the right word. I, I just didn't feel the desire to stay in anymore. I wanted to go back to civilian life and do something different. Make more than six hundred and thirty six dollars a month. And I didn't want to draw fifty five dollars a month combat pay anymore. Or hazardous duty pay, you know.
Did you ever have any contact with the, the Vietnamese people or Vietnamese military? Yeah. During your war? Mm -hmm. You talk about that a little bit. You know, I didn't go to town. Some of the guys would go to town when we were back in base camp. There's a town close to us, and the Vietnamese are always trying to sell you something that people, civilians, and in. And I had no problem with that. They're trying to make a living. I mean, they are dirt poor people. And there's just, there was no hope for them. I mean, I mean, they, they were literally under siege, I think, between, they, they were caught between us and the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. And I don't think, they, they didn't have a lot of hope. And, and some of our guys would go into town and spend money and go in a bar or something like that. I never did that. I didn't, that was not my thing. Once in a great, great while, I would go in and take candy bars and give them to the little kids. You know, and then they'd follow you almost back to the base camp begging for more. You know, but it was only a couple of blocks. But I, I just didn't, you know, the Army gave us two free beers a day when we were in base camp. I, I didn't see a need to go out and sit in a bar and, and I was always concerned about a mortar or an attack. And you don't want to have, you know, beer or alcohol influenced when that's coming in because you just don't, you know, that and weapons don't mix. And I just didn't have a desire to go to town. The Vietnamese, we had Vietnamese people that came in and cleaned our barracks every day, in our tents every day. They were nice, nice ladies. Uh, we would give them you know, a couple of bucks every now and then and they were ecstatic about that. They took the rats out. We had a Vietnamese barber that came in that um, would give us a haircut, no electricity. They um, just snipped, but he'd give you a good haircut. And uh, he had to pay for it. I can't believe the Army didn't pay for our haircuts. But um, I always joke that if you an Army time, they should pay for it. But um, um, I, 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 you know, we, we'd, we'd go to Saigon once in a while. Honestly, a couple of us, two or three of us, would sneak off and go to Saigon. We'd go to supply sergeant and get some camouflage uniforms or some uniforms, uh, fatigues, boots, and um, go to Saigon and trade them with the Navy guys for steaks. And uh, because they couldn't get combat fatigues because the Navy were not, you know, in on, on boots on the ground kind of thing. But they but they dock at Saigon or something, and then we we'd go down there and we'd trade those guys. They had steaks, we didn't. We had fatigues, they didn't. We both wanted each, so we'd trade those and come back. And then we would grill. We made a barbecue grill. I just cut a 55 gallon barrel in half and welded some grates together, and you know, grilled some steaks about once every couple three months. But but the problem is you you still had sea ration beans and. You know, you'd open those up and warm them up. And, but it was good. I mean, it was a nice change. It was almost a celebration, you know, to have decent food. I was going to that was one of my next questions, was meals. A lot of sea rations. You learned to take C4, uh, which was explosive, but it needed a cap in it. But we would take C4, and you could light it, and you could, a small piece, I mean, the size of a quarter, and you could you know, maybe an inch thick, and you could put it under a can of beanie weenies or, or whatever the, the, um, you're trying to heat up, and in 30 seconds it would be boiling. And we, you know, so we used that rather than eating it cold once in a while. Um, I mean, we had plenty of C4 to blow trees and blast trees and, and stuff like that that would, you know, lift them up out of the ground, then we could knock them down and shove them or cut them up and, and stuff. And, um, um, I, the, the mess hall did the, really, they did the best they could with what they had. I mean, they, they served, you know, we had powdered eggs, we had coffee, you learned to drink cold coffee. Um, I remember we had a second lieutenant, and I had been there probably two years then, because I was getting ready to rotate out. They called it DROS, the date to return to overseas, from overseas. It was an acronym. and. Um, we had a second lieutenant, and, and the officers and the enlisted and the non-commissioned officers ate in a little partition area back from the uh, regular people at the mess tent. 
And we had a second lieutenant that came in, and he introduced him, he, captain introduced him to all of us, and he was becoming a platoon leader. And he was sunburned, he'd been in there a week, and you know, it was November, October, and he, you know, so he was sunburned, he knew he'd been just new in country, and, and um, we were just visiting and talking about what was going on and what we were doing and what we planned on doing for this day and, you know, the next day or something like that. And, and this lieutenant says, get the, get the um, mess sergeant in here. He says, my bread's got bugs in it. And I said, lieutenant, you'll get used to that. They have soft bones. They digest real easy. You'll get used to that. And he says, I'm going to give you an Article 15, which was... Like, kind of like a speeding ticket. You know, you pay a $15 fine and it goes on your record. And our captain said, uh, Captain Yoshitani said, don't mess with Voss. He's been here two years. You're better off following him than giving him any crap. He said, he'll, he'll, you'll learn a lot more from him than, than worrying about bugs in your bread. And, uh, I mean, you couldn't keep the bugs out of the flour. It was, you know, I don't know where the, I don't know if the flower came from Australia or Vietnam or where it came from or the U.S. or, but you know bugs get find a way to get into food, and it, we just it, we take it for granted. A little dead bug in a flower isn't going to kill you, you know. I've had it happen in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, I mean you, you you do two things: you either break, eat the bread or you skip the bread, you know. The best meals were probably breakfast because we had eggs, you know, once in a while meat. We had toast. Um, sea rations, we traded around a lot. You know, some guys liked one thing, some guys didn't like another, some guys liked another. Um, our sea rations were old though. Some of those were dated in the 50s. I think they had to be from Korea. But, I, you know, as far as I'm, you know, they, we never got sick from them. You know, so I'm guessing they were sealed tight. And, I'm sure back then they never had a shelf life on anything, so, I mean, we took a P-38 and opened them and ate them, you know, they give you a little plastic spoon and a plastic fork and you ate them. Um, I think one of the reasons, and I, I don't mean to butt in, no, I think no. one of the reasons I went to the Army, uh, my father was farming and Dad was probably... 25, 26 years old, married my older brother, was four, I think, and lived in a small town, farming community, and dad had a deferment because he was a farmer, so in World War II, if you were a farmer, you were essential to the war for food, and dad had a deferment, he didn't have to go, didn't ask for it, was granted it, and um, but he walked downtown on a Saturday night, him and Mama, my little brother, and Dad said, the, the people were staring at me. You know, he was mid-twenties, maybe 26, 27, I don't know exactly. And Dad said, I just really got this real guilt complex because their sons or brothers or nephews or something were in the Army and I wasn't, you know. So dad gave up his military deferment and enlisted. And um, I think that's the reason I went to the Army. Dad was in the Army. And, and another reason I went to the Army is if you enlist in the Air Force at that time, it was a four-year obligation. If you enlist in the Marine Corps at that time, it was a four-year obligation. And the Navy was a four-year obligation. The Army was three. So I think I took the lesser of the evils and, you know, I thought three years is enough. I can always, if I want to re-enlist, if I want to make it a career, I can. But, you know, I have the option to get out at three, not at four. And um, so I went to the Army. Because, because Dad did. You know. And my younger brother went to the Army. I think because I, myself and Dad did. My older brother was kind of caught age group. Um, he was kind of old. He was married and had a couple of kids, you know, during Vietnam. And he was... I mean, he wasn't even considered by the draft. Um, but, you know, that's what I did. That's why I did it, I think, if my memory's right. But it's a lot of years ago. <laughs> exactly. What about, um, so you left Vietnam and were out of the service. Mm -hmm. 
I left Vietnam. Vietnam didn't leave me. Yeah. I that. <laughs> um, so coming back, did you come back in uniform? Yeah. That's and an what was that's what, an interesting. What comment. was your reception? That was an interesting question. That's an interesting question. I got discharged in Oakland, California, on November 30th, 1968. The supply person, whatever it was, you get class A uniforms. I mean, all I had was fatigues. <clears throat> you fly back on the plane, you get off the plane, you kiss the ground and say, I'm home. And literally, I mean, we would kiss, we kissed the ground at the Oakland airport and said, we're home. You, you go through everything, you go through your physicals and stuff like that. And if you need any shots, they bring you up to date on shots and stuff and, and check your teeth and, and they, and then they give you a class A uniform and they put all the medals on them and the stripes and everything are sewn on them. So, I mean, you're looking good. You're looking sharp. It's the first time you've been in class A uniform in, you know, three years, two years, two and a half years. And um, the guy that gave me the uniform, he said, do you have civilian clothes? I said, no. I said, you know, you, there's no worry. I, had, I mean, I had civilian clothes when I went to Malaysia. You know, you bought them over there, but then you just... Threw in the trash can because you didn't need them. You put your fatigues back on, you came back to Vietnam. And he said, I would highly recommend that you stop at a clothing store and get some civilian clothes. He said, You're not, may not, he said, This is not a popular war and you not may not be received well. And I said, I'm fine. You know, I mean, I was bulletproof then. I was out of the army. I've been through Vietnam 26 months. Nothing's going to happen. So I get in the cab, the cab driver says, would you like to stop at a store and get some civilian clothes? I says, why? He says, you may not be well received. I said, oh, I can't be. You know, I, God, I ought to be open, welcome with open arms, you know. Yeah. Just like the gentleman that left here earlier today, I said, thank you for your service. Said, that never happened to us. And um, so I fly to Oakland to Denver. Um, I'm walking through the Denver airport and a woman spits at me and calls me a baby killer. The old Terry Voss would have turned around and choked her. The new Terry Voss just ignored her and walked on. And I thought, that can't be for real. I mean, that had to be, a, you know, was, it, was the cab driver and the, and the supply guy in Oakland real? And um, I got into Omaha, my mom and dad met me, went back home to Iowa, and I applied, you know, all I had was a high school education, thought about going to college on the GI Bill, because we didn't have any money, and um, I think I was received fairly okay. I was received great by family, my grandparents, my brothers, my sisters, my cousins, um, but not everybody in town was a fan of the Vietnam War. You know, and it's small town Iowa, and I had a heck of a time getting a job. I finally went and worked construction, you know, built, I built the interstate, you know, worked construction for a year, and then I finally got a job in Sioux City um, at a machine tool warehouse. We sold drill bits and welding rod and stuff. Then I went to work for a chemical company in the transportation department. Um, but you were not, even early 70s, I mean, it was, you didn't say you were a Vietnam veteran. You know, I mean, even though I was proud of serving, it, it, it could start some pretty good arguments, you know. And, you know, and my best defense was, the, or, this country sent me there. I did, what, I, I did what my country told me to do. I did what my country asked me to do. Um, I'm not going to apologize for that, you know. We're all born American. It's our job to do what our government tells us, even if we disagree or not. I mean, we have to go, and there wasn't an option. I wasn't going to go to Canada, you know, and, and be, dodge the draft or anything. I was going to go where they told me to go and do what I and do the best job I could, and I did. And I have no qualms about that. I just didn't flaunt it. I didn't acknowledge it, didn't talk about it with a lot of people until probably 20 years later when it was more accepted, you know. After the war was over, it became a little better, I think. Once, once the Gulf War happened, I think 
Vietnam veterans became more popular. That, that's my own personal take on it. There was a reevaluation. We never got the ticker tape parades. Right. We, we never got the TV station at the airport welcoming us home. You almost feel like like the hippies in a lot of the American country. I'm just checking. I'm, 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 no, we I, we almost felt like the hippies or the American part of the American country, not all by any means, but we felt that the part of the American country despised us. The hippies hated us. I think uh, you had the Kent State thing, you know. Uh, we were not first-class citizens. Um, you know, we, we felt that we felt that I felt I did what my country told me to do, and I got shoved in the corner when I got back home for doing it. When did you start talking about your Vietnam experience? Hmm. I mean. Openly or in groups, and let me rephrase that. Did you join a veterans group when you came back, or I, when I, did you join? I, I'm, a, I'm a member of the VFW. I'm a member of American Legion. I'm a member of the DAV. I'm a member of the Vietnam Veterans of America, and I have not attended six meetings in 50 years. But I support them. I mean, I write them a check every year and I support them. I have gone to a couple of Vietnam Veterans of America meetings. I've gone to three or four here in, in the last six months. Um, I have PTSD fairly, at times fairly bad. I think when I started talking about Vietnam openly it was probably to a psychologist at the VA where I could start to get comfortable to talk about it to you or other people. Uh, my wife and kids don't know what I've gone through. I don't think they ever will. I don't think I'll ever talk to them about it. Um, I don't know if I should. I'm working with a psychologist at the VA about that. I, I, I have some bitterness a little bit about, you know, I mean, when, when, we were, when we were clearing jungle, Agent Orange had been dumped on it. The foliage was gone. It was all the green is gone. Um, I mean, we've had planes fly over where we were had orange on us, you know, from Agent Orange. I, I'm not condemning the Army or the military. That was a good way to get rid of the jungle so you could get rid of their ability to hide and to come at us and to sniper us and stuff like that. The problem with it is, you know, I ended up having a heart attack. I've got ischemic heart disease. I've had a heart ablation. I've got COPD. You know, um, I, I, the, the military used the right, the chemical that they thought was right at the right time, and it probably was. But, you know, that was 1960 science, 50 years ago. You know, they did the right thing back then. It's no different than the dropping the bomb on Hiroshima or Nagasaki. They, they did the right thing at the right time with, the, with, the, with what information and assets they had available to them. I, I don't begrudge him. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm one of those that got caught in it. And there's many others that got caught in it. You know, I was bitter for a long time. After I had my heart attack and the ablation, I was bitter about the Agent Orange and, um, because it's a presumptive condition. It's uh, a what? I'm sorry. Presumptive condition oh, okay. of uh, ischemic heart disease is a presumptive condition of Agent Orange. And uh, so they presume if you've been exposed to Agent Orange, you have a large possibility to get ischemic heart disease, which I have, and um, and the VA acknowledges that. And the the PTSD I think is just comes from things things I've seen, things I've been through, things we've done, and you you try to live with that and say it was part of the job that I did. You know, um, um, I've talked to the pastor at my church some about that, about, you know, the, you know, 
one of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not kill. Um, he and I agreed that it means thou shalt not murder because if you're sent to war, you're taught to kill. Yeah. I don't know if I killed anybody. Uh, I mean, you don't look, you don't go out. Somebody else does that job. Um, but we just, it was a tough time. It was a tough time. I, ironically, my dad and I talked one day when he was still alive, and he said, would you take a million dollars for your experience in Vietnam? I said, no. And he said, would you take a million dollars to go back? I said, no. I mean, I, Dad said I went to Vietnam at age 18, and I came home I was 30. Two years later, I grew up. I, I, you know, I, you had to grow up. You, know, you, you had to go. You went over there as an 18-year-old kid, and, but you had to make some tough decisions, and you had to follow some pretty tough orders. You learned discipline. And you, you come home a lot smarter and a lot wiser and a lot more humble than you were as an eight, and a lot more mature than you were as an 18 year old kid two years later. I mean, I got 10, Dad said you got 10 years of education in two years, and 10 years of growing up in two, in two years. And he, I believe he's totally right. The temper I had at 18 is gone, was gone when I got home, the short fuse was gone. The, the smart aleck know-it-all was gone. Um, Vietnam took it out of me. <laughs> you know, I grew up there, you know, and, and I credit Vietnam for, for me growing up there. I, I credit my time in the Army, um, the discipline, the, the ability to think and stuff, to some of the successes I've had after I got out of the military. Um, I went on to a fairly successful career. And um, I think a lot of my Vietnam experience was because of that. I learned, and I listened how to take orders. You know, I learned to think on my own. I learned to make decisions on my own. And you have to make them in a hurry sometimes. But, but you mature. And I think I, I learned that in Vietnam. Kind of two questions coming up here. You mentioned that you You've not spoken to your wife or children about your Vietnam experience? No. Do you think they would want to hear about it? I mean, you'll get a copy of this. Oh. I mean, did your dad, I guess, let dad me never rephrase talked about it. Your dad didn't talk about dad it? Never, dad went to his grave never saying anything. And now do you wish you knew more about what his experience was? Yeah. So thinking in those terms. Do you think maybe it would be helpful if it's if Vietnam had such an impact on your life? Do you think it would be good for your children and wife to know more about it? I don't. I'm going to answer that two ways. First off, I was a good father and a poor daddy. Okay. I worked, 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 worked. I worked way too many hours. My wife raised my daughters. And I wasn't there when I should have been because I was so driven to excel, you yeah. know, to succeed in life so my family would have, so I could pay for college, you know, so the girls could be educated, so we could live comfortably and the other side of that question is your timing is impeccable. Last week I bought five, I ordered and bought five dog tags with my name, Boss Terry J, 16858933, my serial number. Uh, there's five, my one, two. Lutheran O for my blood type. And there's something I can't remember. The, but the, I bought five sets of dog tags for my grandkids, and I thought about giving them to them at Christmas next week. But they're only—I mean, they're fifteen, thirteen, five, two, and 
two and a half. They have no meaning to them. And then I thought, should I give them to my wife and my two daughters? Um, that's the closest thing to talking or, or even mentioning anything about military that I've done in 50 years. I do every year type out a note to my girls and say, you know, here's where our bank account is, here's where this is, here's where this is. And when I die, here's how I want to do my funeral. I want to be buried at the VA cemetery here. I want to, um, I want, my wife's father was a Navy veteran and he's got the flag. And I said, I want one of you girls to have the flag, my flag, one of you girls to take grandpa's flag and be proud of it because I earned it. So that's as close as I've talked to my kids about that at all. One time we were coming home from Kansas City and there was something on the radio, some kind of talk or something like that. And my wife said something and we were, it was a little bit of a sharp conversation. And I said, Cheryl, you don't know what I've been through. And you don't want to know. And I don't want to tell you. So let's just drop it. And I can't remember what started that conversation, but I can remember, and this is the last year or two, just coming up the Interstate 29, I said, you don't know what I've been through. You don't want to know. I don't want to tell you. And let's just leave it there. Well, you will get a copy of this. It, okay. It's helpful. I mean, we didn't go into a lot of the details. Mm -hmm. But just so you know, so that this will be available for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other question I had at that time, and not to diminish any sure. possible positive thoughts about you sharing your experience, which mm -hmm. I would encourage. Um, have you maintained contact with any of the people you served with? No. Or re reconnected. Re thank you. <laughs> you know that senior that se those senior moments reconnected with anybody. Tried to go to a reunion for any of these years. I've not gone to a reunion. Um, or tried like online connecting? I, ironically, in the last couple of weeks, there's a website, Vietnam Buddy Finder. Oh, okay. On Facebook. I didn't know a thing about it. Um, uh, I belong to a 9th Infantry Division website uh, just because I was in the 9th Infantry Division. And honestly, because they only post about six times a week, so you're not getting flooded with all the junk that you want to go through. I have connected, a guy from north, Northwest Iowa, Sioux Center, Iowa, connected with me about six months ago and sent me a picture of me in Vietnam and wants me to send him some and he wants to try to connect with our old company. We were A Company 15th Combat Engineers, 9th Infantry Division. And he wanted to connect with me and uh, we did, we emailed back and forth. We haven't talked on the phone. I don't think, we might have. It's been six, eight months. And I thought, you know, I had a good, very good friend in, in Pennsylvania uh, that I thought about reaching out to. I had a good, very good friend in California, which might be hard. I mean, both of those are huge population states. And what this v Vietnam Buddy Finder is pretty good. And I might be able to contact them. I. If I do, I don't know what I'd say. I will tell you something I did, and I, and I don't know if I did the right thing or the wrong thing. I told you this story about <clears throat> the three people that went out and got, that I was supposed to, but I had two that went out and they were killed and ambushed. Right. Okay. Charles Lance was one of them. He's my first sergeant, very, very, very good friend. I found him on the Vietnam Wall, obviously. March 17th. Um, 1967, um, St. Patrick's Day, 
horrible day for me every year for 50 years. Lost all three of those guys then. I found where his daughter had written something. I called her. Don't know whether I should have or not. Talked to her for 30 minutes. Don't know whether she was appreciative of him or not. But I told her what a great man her father was. And that, that um, and we had a, we had a good conversation, I would say. Um, Sergeant Lance was a great, great, great man. Feared nothing. And, um, but he, um, I, I just felt I owed a phone call to his daughter to tell her that somebody that served under her father or with her father, how great a man he was and how good a soldier he was and what he did for his country. I think it's marvelous. If I was the daughter, I'd be thrilled. You know, but you know, I, I think she was taken aback because I don't think for the first 10 minutes she thought I was real, you know. And I can certainly understand that. I mean, 40 years later out of the clear blue, somebody calls you up. And, um, but I just thought, you know, they need to know. And if they don't, if, if, if they blow it off, they blow it off. But it's something I wanted to say. And it had been bothering me for a while when I, because I had saw where she had written, I saw where her hometown was and I Googled her and found her. And I said, I, I just want you to know how great your father was and what a good first sergeant he was for our company, what a good first sergeant and friend he was to me and what he did for the company and what he did for his country. He didn't die in vain. He did doing what he thought he was supposed to do, what it was right. He did what his company, country asked him to do. You know, he's a hero. Be proud of that. You know, and uh, I think we ended it okay. We didn't agree to call each day in contact or anything like that, but I felt good doing it. You know, and the psychologist at the VA said, "Yeah, I don't know if you should do that." And I said, "I already did it." You know, so yeah, I, well, I said, "You know, I feel better for doing it because maybe hearing how good your father was maybe makes her go to bed a little easier that night. If not, I'm sorry." And I told her, I'm sorry. And she said, no, 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 don't apologize for calling me and telling me. So. I'm sure you caught her totally off guard. Oh, I, there's no doubt. And it took me two weeks to get the guts to call her. You know, I mean, something as simple as that, you know, I mean. Because you don't know what to say. You don't know what your reception is going to be. No, I mean, I had a guy tell me one time, you know, you'd charge hell with a bucket of water, Terry. And, <laughs> and I'm afraid to call this lady up to compliment her, you know, on her father. Um, but it's, it's, it was different. It was different. interesting about this buddy finder. Anything else you'd like to add about the mili your experience with the military? You, you know, know I, 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 I'm glad I went. I'm glad I enlisted in the Army. It was the right thing to do. I, I think we're obligated to do that as, as young men in this country, we're obligated to support this country. I, I, I will take no crap. I will take for going. I'm proud that I went. I'm proud I enlisted. I'm glad I went. I'm glad I served. I think everybody should have the opportunity to serve. Um, You know, it, it's, it's a great, great country. I don't know that all, every war we've been in is right, but it's not my decision to decide which war is right. But I'm glad I had the opportunity to, to not necessarily defend our country because the Vietnamese weren't, the Viet Cong were not attacking us, but to try to maybe fix some of the atrocities that they were doing in South Vietnam. So I'm, I'm glad I did that. And I'm glad I got home safe. Well, so am I. <laughs> so are all of us. I'm sure your wife and children are yeah. also. Okay, thank you. We're done? I, well, it's been an hour. Okay. We've been... Off the record? <laughs>